to move it. Yeah. I was given the authority to move the mic. So. <laughs> Wow, God's angry, isn't he, in that passage? It's like, wow. Now, three months ago, um, Andy Pierce sent a message out to everyone who speaks and says, these are all the passages that um, we need preaching on. Uh, and this one today was on Amos. Now, before the Bible in two years uh, started this year, I'd never read Amos. I didn't even know where it was when it, when it came up on the list. I was like, oh, I'll go and have a look at that. And I went, I'm up for a challenge. I'll do Amos. Um, so, and I'm so glad that I did. Because actually there is um, so much in Amos for us um, today um, to think about. So today we're going to look at the whole book. Luckily it's only nine chapters but it will take me about four hours to get through all nine chapters. Is, is that okay? Possibly not. So what we're going to do is we're going to do some very big, broad strokes um, through Amos. So there's lots of detail that I'm going to overlook. Um, and I would suggest if you kind of, if anything comes to mind in there, by all means, come and talk to me about it. Uh, we can discuss the detail uh, later. But throughout the Bible in two years, um, when I'm uh, doing sermons, um, my aim is to help us set the passage or the book into the context of the whole Bible. Um, and really looking at that whole Bible, seeing that pretty much everything, not everything, let's go everything, let's be bold here, points to Jesus. Now, I've heard a few people here um, say over this year, since starting the Bible in two years, that they don't recognize the God of the Old Testament. Or, when we've finished Old Testament, oh, I'm so pleased we're now on to the New Testament, and we've got old, rid of the Old Testament for a while. Yes, the Old Testament is hard. Wars, destruction, people doing weird and downright offensive things. We even had a talking donkey at one point. However, all of this is important, and ultimately because it shows us the need for Jesus to be our salvation. The power of the New Testament is not shown to its fullness unless we know and understand the story of the old. And the Old Testament doesn't make sense unless we relate it to the New Testament. In April, when I spoke about, uh, on Romans, I linked the New Testament back to the Old. So this morning, it's the time to link the Old to the New. So let's get stuck into Amos. It might be helpful uh, for you to have it out in front of you if you can either on your phone or on your Bible. I'm going to be flicking through, starting at 1, and we're going to end up landing in chapter 9. So as I say, this is nine-chapter book, uh, near the end of the Old Testament. And Amos was a shepherd. And God de uh, decided to use him as a prophet. He was not like the big... Uh, powerful prophets that we know of the Old Testament, uh, like uh, Samuel. He was not a prophet's son or even earned a living from his ministry. He looked after sheep. But God uses ordinary people in, all through the Bible um, to bring his message. And the reason that he did this on this occasion was because Israel had quite firmly turned its back on God, and God had to give it a wake-up call. So in chapters 1 and 2, it is uh, showing the sins of Israel and its neighbours. Damascus, Gaza, Tyre, Emom, Ammon, Moab, Judah, and Israel. All had sinned, and all was going to feel the fire of God as he punished them of his sins. It goes into detail of what Israel had done 
in chapter 2, verses 6 and 8. Selling the righteous for silver, trampling on the heads of the poor, denying justice of the oppressed, using sexual relations as power. This shows that they rejected the power of God and wanted it for themselves. It has been seen through the history of the Bible and modern history, people in power, afraid of one thing, and that is losing power. Therefore, they demonstrate their power over the oppressed, over the poor. And many of the issues we face in our society today is where the people in power are, be, are oppressing the people without that power. And as today, as we remember the, those results of war, we think of the reasons for many of those wars. And it's for, because of people wanting power and keeping hold of it. God had done so much for Israel only for them to throw it back in his face. The poetry of chapter 3, as Adele read first, um, explains why God is so upset. God is longing after, after relationship with his people. Chapter 3 talks of the pairs that don't work on their own or when one party is not committed to it. So chapter 3, verse 3, talking about two, walk, two people walking together, where one of them isn't interested. Just imagine two people walking together and the other one is just not interested there. Completely pointless than walking together, and actually quite awkward. Or in verses 4 and 5, where it talks about the lion roaring, or the bird swooping for nothing, showing that when we're not in relationship, it looks foolish. Why would the lion roar? Why would the bird swoop when it's nothing to do? Or in verse 6, when it talks about the trumpet sounding, but no one responding to it. I feel that God saying, is actually anyone listening to me? God wants relationship with us. That is why he made it, made us, and it doesn't make sense without this relationship. As many of you know, I'm a teacher, and I think it's a good analogy of what's going on here. So just imagine for a second a perfect scenario where the teacher and the students would work in harmony with each other. You need to use your imagination here. <laughs> Ideally, the classroom would not need any rules because each party fully recognizes the need of the other and work together to allow the students and the teachers to be successful. However, as we all know, a perfect classroom does not exist. Students struggling to the point of disturbance for many reasons, possibly because they think they know best and want to set the agenda in that room, or secondly, and actually um, quite sadly, that they struggle in that relationship, possibly uh, because of underlying uh, conditions. Many uh, that I teach suffer uh, or have suffered horrendous things at home and in society, which when I hear of what they go through, actually seeing them in my classroom, I'm astonished they can actually turn up. But it does mean they struggle to have a good relationship with me as the teacher. Now, of course, with all good analogies, there's a massive hole in that one. I don't know if anyone had spotted it. I'm not God. Hopefully people ma ma manage to see that. So unlike the relationship with the God and his people, teachers are also not perfect. And the teacher is also can be sometimes a problem. 
But if we see that analogy where it is the students that are uh, the problem, then it helps us think about um, what, what God is looking at here in Amos. God is perfect, uh, but it's uh, worth thinking about this heading through the Old Testament. Okay, what is God's people doing? Now, I'm going to do a very, very quick overview, miss a whole of the Old Testament out. But we start with Genesis 1 and 2, God and man in perfect harmony, that perfect classroom. Okay? But then the humans are distracted by the devil. Humans then want to set their own agenda. Humans think that they know best. The people before Noah, therefore God had to set the flood. The flood. The times in Judges, as we've just read, where Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, to quote quite the few starting parts of uh, chapters in Judges, did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And in Samuel 1, that we have just finished, uh, distracted by other nations around them who had a king, said, we need that power, um, therefore demanded a king themselves. So like the uh, picture of the school, rules were needed so students, or here humans, knew what the expectations was to help them be successful. Some followed, some didn't. In school, there are consequences for not following these rules. The consequences, however, are not decided just to punish those students. They're designed to bring back students into the place where they are ready to learn. So reminding them of the rules or expectations, giving them a warning, giving them a second warning, sending them to an additional room, suspending them for school for a period of time, behavior contracts, temporary changing schools or permanently changing schools, each time ramping up that punishment, uh, or that sanction. But, all importantly, designing, designed to bring back that student-teacher relationship. And so it was with God. He had to punish his people so that they could learn how to be right with him. If he was just going to forgive them, then it shows that that behavior can continue. More about that in a moment. Now, God is a little bit ex more extreme with his punishment than we're allowed to uh, as teachers. Losing battles, therefore, uh, so he's, God makes Israel lose battles, therefore losing uh, people's lives, and God's nation losing its station its status around the known world. Diseases of both themselves and their crops and fire sweeping through towns. Exile from the Holy Land. But notice this, never total uh, destruction. The Lord never totally destroyed Israel in the Old Testament. It was never God's intention to fully wipe out his people because his intention is to have relationship with us. Back in chapter 4, Israel was not taking the hint. Verse 9, gardens struck with blight and mildew. Verse 10, the plagues. Verse 11, God overthrowing uh, the nations. But... In all three, it says, but you did not return to me. So those sanctions of showing that he was angry, trying to bring him back, wasn't working. And God had enough. Verse 12 in chapter 4, prepare to meet your God and not in a good way. I think this is the closest that I have seen in the Old Testament of God fully losing it. And if you've ever been a teacher or are a teacher and been on that brink of almost fully losing it, you know what I mean. In chapter 7, 
Israel still thinking that they were in charge, even though they heard all of this prophecy, had the audacity to go to Amos to tell him to stop prophesying against them. Like that was going to help. Stop prophesying of what God's going to do. Well, God's going to do it anyway. Yeah, but we're in charge. You stop and it won't happen. Of course it's going to happen. But it shows the arrogance of his people at that time. Now we're going to jump straight into chapter uh, 9 now because it all sounds a bit... hmm. But there is some hope. The hope is on its way. God is almost going to totally destroy Israel. The start of chapter 9. He's going to bring down the pillars on the head of the people. No one's going to get away. He's going to hunt down those ones hiding. Send serpents to bite those at the bottom of the sea. Now if anyone wants to discuss that one with me later. That's quite an interesting um, verse. We we will read later uh, in our Bible in two years what that destruction looks like when the Israelites are sent into exile and lose their status as a mighty nation. But why is it irrelevant? So why is it relevant for us today, the book of Amos? We see today that God is a God of love, but here we see God as a God of destruction. But we do also, here, see God as a God of love. Because he has a plan, and that plan, Jesus. Now, if you do have uh, your Bibles, if you turn to Amos chapter 9, verse 11, and we haven't uh, seen this yet. So, Amos 9, 11. In that day, I will, re- I will restore David's fallen tent. I will repair its broken pieces, restore its ruins, and build it as it used to be, so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and the, all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do all these things. These days are coming. So God here in Amos, almost losing it, almost thinking total destruction is the only way I'm going to teach them a lesson, but pulling back and saying, I have a plan. Jesus, a descendant of David, will come to repair these broken pieces. That is that promise uh, at the end of Amos. So let's think about what Jesus actually did to sort this mess out. First, he showed us what a relationship with God looks like. Through his life, called us as Christians to godly living. How can we live our lives in glory to him? How do we live our lives in relationship with him? But that's what the law of the Old Testament also was trying to do. So if we just see Jesus as a nice man who demonstrated God's love, then it's very easy for us to slip back into our power struggles, thinking, therefore, it's all about us, wanting to be the author of our own fate. No. Jesus was also sent to pull us back into that relationship. Not just teach us how to be in that relationship, but actually sometimes kicking, screaming back into that relationship. The death on the cross that Jesus went through, punishing our sins, when we think about Holy Communion, the bread that we take, that body that is broken for us, punishing our sins. And the wine of Holy Communion, washing us clean. The death on the cross, punishing Jesus for all of our sins, for all of the sins before he was even uh, came onto earth, and for every sin 
since his earthly body was hung on that cross means we can have relationship with him. Therefore, if we just look at the cross and nothing else in the Bible, we really don't fully understand the power of it. If we don't understand the broken relationship that God had with his people in the Old Testament. Did Jesus really have to die on a cross? That is why the Old Testament is so important for our faith. So today, I have three questions for you to ponder. Number one, do you recognize Jesus' sacrifice on the cross as a way for you to get back to our Heavenly Father and that relationship he wants with us. Number two, how is your relationship with God today? Where is your relationship? Is your relationship with God today the couple of hours that we sat, spend sat in here? Or is it a daily walk? And number three, are you holding on to power in your life rather than sacrificing it to God so that full relationship with God 